Good morning, good evening, good night, good afternoon, whatever it is where you are listening, welcome to the River of Suck podcast. You have to suck at something before you can be good at it. I'm your host, Andy Reiner. I release a new episode every month, so each year is a new season. Happy 2020! For episode one of season two, we have a very special guest, Temple Grandin, PhD. She is a professor of animal science at Colorado State University, a public speaker at her own conferences and TED conferences. She's received countless awards and has made an enormous impact on the lives of children with autism and on the welfare of millions, billions of animals. Hi, Temple. Pleased to meet you. Great to be here. Wonderful to have you. I've been reading your books, and I actually saw you speak at the Stanley Hotel okay. over in Estes Park because it was for a CSU event. That was a CSU event, and they, yes. And they hired my band to play music for the oh, barbecue good. people. I didn't know that you played music for our barbecue. Okay. <laughs> for our animal science barbecue, in fact. Well, I heard you were speaking. It was my so department. I, yeah. So <laughs> that was awesome. So I went down there, and I heard you speak, and I saw all these Really amazing kids who are so excited to see you in person, and it, it was a great event. Well, I want to see these kids uh, be successful yeah, and uh, get good careers. I'm seeing too many kids that have got some really good skills in music, mathematics, programming, art, uh, mechanics, just getting shunted into special ed. They're not going anywhere. Hmm. Uh, when I was out working in construction with the meat industry, I mean, I worked out in the field steel and concrete construction, equipment installation, every single major meat company, I've worked with them. And I worked with a lot of high-end skilled trades in steel working and equipment design, where 20% of them were either autistic, dyslexic, ADHD. Hmm. The special ed department built the stuff. <laughs> and what's happening now is those people are retiring, and we've got a gigantic shortage. High-end skilled trades, like electrician, hmm. plumbing, mechanics, uh, welders who can read drawings, the guy who can just invent equipment and build anything, and we're actually uh, losing skills. Hmm. We don't make elevators anymore, ski lifts, <laughs> uh, poultry processing plant. The folks who listen to River of Suck podcast, also known as the River of Suck swim team, have a very big thing in common, striving to live with a growth mindset taking every moment as an opportunity to learn and to become a better person, even in the face of uncomfortable and new situations. You are someone who has faced many uphill battles and successfully swam upstream to discover yourself and your purpose. I had to work really hard to get good at what I do. Yeah. It was a whole lot of work. It didn't just uh, happen overnight. In fact, when I started out in the cattle industry, uh, the biggest problem I had was being a woman in a man's industry because I started working on this uh, back in the 70s. Mm. And there were no women working out in the feed yards. Wow. And uh, that was the biggest obstacle. People lot of think autism would be the biggest obstacle, but it wasn't. In fact, um, as an autistic person, I'm an extreme visual thinker. That was shown really nicely in the HBO movie uh, Temple Grandin. Everything I think about is a picture. So when I first started working with cattle, it was obvious to me to look at what they were seeing. And at the time, I didn't know I thought in pictures. I thought everybody thought in pictures. <laughs> and I noticed that cattle would uh, refuse to go through a shoot if it had a shadow or a bright spot or a rope across it or a coat uh, hanging on the fence. Things that a lot of people just didn't notice, the cattle uh, noticed that. And you felt a connection to them. Well, I certainly understood how their visual world worked. I originally was a psychology major, and I was fascinated by optical illusions because in high school, I saw a Bell Labs movie about the Ames distorted room and the trapezoidal window optical illusions, <laughs> where one person looks uh, much bigger than the other one. My science teacher said to me, I want you to figure out how to make it. He wasn't going to tell me how to make it. He wanted oh. me to figure it out for myself. And so I got real interested in experimental psychology. And some of the things I learned in psychology and in neuroscience helped me in my cattle work. This is an example of going across disciplines. Mm -hmm. Originally, I was a psych major. And then I switched majors after I went one year through a master's degree to um, animal science. So solving problems makes you feel good. Yeah, I like solving problems. <laughs> That's kind of an engineering mindset. You try to figure out how to solve a problem. And I find that 
People don't ask enough questions when they're trying to solve a dog behavior problem, a mm -hmm. horse behavior problem, or even a problem with a child. They go, what do you do with crazy dogs? What do you do with autistic kids in the classroom? Well, I have to have a lot more information before right. I can answer it. For example, with a dog, is he crazy nice jumping on you or crazy nasty biting you? <laughs> There's no way I, to kn Those I know. Those are different. <laughs> One of my things that I'm very interested in discussing now is different kinds of minds. Visual thinking and pictures like me are object visualizer, mm -hmm. uh, the more mathematical pattern, visual, uh, pattern thinker, which is music and math. And then there's people that are a word thinker. They mm. think in words. In education today, I think it's really been taken over by the word thinkers. Huh. And they tend yeah. to overgeneralize. You know, the problem you've got with something like autism, and it goes all the way from Einstein, who had no speech till age three, some famous musicians that were really weird, to yeah. somebody who never learns to dress themselves. Hmm. It all has the same word. And people are getting too much locked into that word. What is autism like for someone who doesn't know or hasn't met any people with autism? Well, a brain can either be more thinking or intellectual, or it can be emotional. Mm -hmm. Social circuits t take up a lot of processor space in the brain. So if you're building a brain, do I make a person more social or make them more, so more intellectual and memory? Hmm. You see, on the mild ends of the spectrum, it's just personality variation. Now, when you start getting things like language delay, then it's definitely... Um, uh, you've got a problem there, and mm -hmm. it's very important to work with young kids and try to get the language going. Yeah. But in the milder forms, it's, it's a variant. There's been some interesting new research. There's an interesting paper called Genomic Trade-Offs. Mm -hmm. Are autism and schizophrenia the steep price for a human brain? The huh. same genes that make the brain big also cause autism and schizophrenia, and it's lots of little bits of code. It's mm. not a simple trait like... Um, Black coat's going to be dominant on a dog or on, right. on cattle. It's not simple like that. Um, it's a complex, continuous trait with lots of little tiny bits of code that kind of add up. When it comes to rem remembering music, if I know the lyrics uh, or, the, or I have the picture, mm -hmm. like the Blue Danube uh, classical music will always be associated with the Pan Am space shuttle docking with the space station in 2001, A Space Odyssey. Yeah. Um, I see that picture. Hmm. Now, some other classical music I really like, I have a hard time accessing it in my memory because it hasn't been used as a score in a movie. Huh. See, everything goes back to a picture. Sometimes I get kind of musical memories. I was out in California, and I went by this old broken wooden garage, and I thought, inside a rickety old garage, there was a brand new super stock Dodge. <laughs> go, Granny, go, Granny, go, Granny, go. <laughs> And that tune came to me when I looked at the garage. Oh, yeah. Wow. So. I don't know. For some reason, when I get off the train yeah. at the airport, you know, that this is Colonel Tom to ground control. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I think about that when I get off the train at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> You've said that you would never choose to discard your autism because it makes you who you are. Why do you think differences that make us unique are so commonly disparaged? And why should we embrace our quirks? Well, I like the fact that I think visually. Um, I have a lot more memory than most people have if I can store a graphics file. Mm -hmm. I also think extremely logically. Hmm. And I'm appalled at just how illogical so many humans are. <laughs> and I like the logical way I think. But the big problem I'm seeing now, especially with young kids, 8, 9, 10, or 11-year-old kids, is their whole identity is getting tied up with their autism. Mm. And I don't think that's a good thing. Autism is an important part of who I am, but being a scientist, mm -hmm. that comes before the autism does. I want people to know who haven't come across your work before, what exactly did you change in the cattle industry? How well, did one of the first things I started out was working on some better designs for cattle handling facilities. And when I first started out in my twenties, one of the mistakes I made, and a lot of engineering type of people make this mistake, mm -hmm. we better watch out when it comes to artificial intelligence, hmm. is they think they can make self-managing systems. <laughs> and I actually thought I could make a self-managing cattle handling facility. That's rubbish. 
<laughs> people want the thing more than they want the management. Hmm. I can make a better cattle handling facility, but somebody's got to operate it correctly. Mm -hmm. That is the management side of things. Mm -hmm. And you can't solve management problems with equipment. But you have made some well, yes, I have. I've, uh, yeah, well, I've <laughs> I've designed the all the cattle handling facilities for every Cargill beef plant in North America. Wow. This would be the unloading area, stockyards. You can go on my website, grandon.com, and uh, see things I've made. There's a video called a Beef Plant Video Tour with Temple Grandon. You can look at it on the animalhandling.org website. Mm -hmm. There's also links to it on my video library in grandon.com. that will show the stuff that I've made. Now, one of the things that made the biggest change in the industry, more than the equipment did, Mm -hmm. was a simple scoring system I developed for assessing whether a meat packing plant was uh, behaving itself or not. And you measured five simple things. Stunning efficacy, make sure everything's dead before they cut it up, electric prod score, falling, and vocalization. Mm. And these are what I call critical control points. It's sort of like traffic. Hmm. Traffic rules work because they're simple. So if you're using a critical control approach... If you could only enforce three traffic rules and nothing else, you'd probably enforce drunk driving, speeding, and stopping violations, and you'd sure. get most of your safety. And <laughs> then I'm going to add for four and five texting and seatbelts. Ah. The reason why I didn't put the seatbelts first, they protect me. They don't protect you against me. Ah. But the point is you've got to figure out what are the critical control points. Then in 1999, I was hired by McDonald's Corporation and Wendy's mm -hmm. to teach their food safety auditors how to evaluate their suppliers using this system and we started cleaning up the industry and, and the first they yeah. fail their audits mm. and a lot of the problems was broken equipment bad management no supervision and with a lot of simple changes we could make most of the plants work with simple stuff like non-slip flooring yeah. changing lighting and out of 75 plants that were on that list of pork and beef plants only three had to buy something expensive right um, and it forced them to manage their stuff but also and to fix it. think about the animals and how they're feeling, right? Well, yes, because one of the biggest problems they have is broken, stunning equipment. Ugh. Ugh, yuck is Ugh. right. That's Ugh. a management issue. Yeah. And the industry was kind of surprised. I've got a whole series of journal articles. You can look them up on Google Scholar that I did around uh, 1998, 2000. I've got a paper in 2005. There's about a series of about six papers in the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association, also on applied animal behavior science that outlines uh, what the baseline data was, which was atrocious, hmm. and then how it improved after we started having major customers enforcing this really simple scoring system. It's now the standards for the North American Meat Institute, and it's used around the world. Wow. It made people fix their stuff. And then my major piece of equipment I developed for the big plants was the center track restrainer system. That was in the early 90s. And one of my big frustrations I had before we started the McDonald's audits is half my clients tore up stuff and wrecked it. That just frustrated me. Huh. And then when you have a major customer insisting on doing things right, boy, can that make change. Hmm. But the reason why it worked, it was very simple. Also, I was not shoving equipment down their throat. Hmm. I wasn't trying to sell them stuff. I bent over backwards to not do that because my goal was to, was to improve the industry, mm -hmm. not sell tons of equipment. So I, even though I had a conflict of interest with equipment, I did reverse conflict of interest. Huh. I bent over backwards the other way to make whatever <laughs> they had work. And there were three plants out of the 75 that did have to buy new things. And then we had three plants where we had to give them a manager ectomy. And after we got rid of the plant <laughs> manager... <laughs> then um, things work just fine. How do you say that in a way that people will react? I was in there with the McDonald's food safety team, and we'd have, um, this would be like in 1999, year 2000, I saw more change than I'd seen in my whole entire career prior to that because I forced them to fix broken stuff, supervise employees, move smaller groups of animals, Change lighting, very sensitive lighting. Mm -hmm. We'd move some lights, make a reflection disappear on the floor. Add a light, light up a dark entrance, and then they'd go right in. Stick up a piece of cardboard so they didn't see the people walking by. And then I'd say, now tonight you replace that with metal. 
but a whole lot of simple stuff like that. And when you got McDonald, the power of the Golden Arches behind you, they cleaned, they fixed it. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I wasn't asking them to do crazy, ridiculous, super expensive stuff. Right. I was trying to figure out how to fix it with simple things like non-slip flooring at the unloading ramp, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But all, all from the perspective of the animal. and Well, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's what you saw that they didn't. Well, and the other thing on a lot of these things, people just think too complicated. Now, the <laughs> trend now worldwide is to go with similar things. I just saw some new draft guidelines for the OIE, and it's going to be going with uh, outcome-based measures, simple outcome-based measures, mm -hmm. things like slipping and falling, and, and that's along the same lines as the stuff that I did. I think it's hard for some people to imagine how five simple things could work. But if you get back to traffic, and I told you the five simple things, mm -hmm. drunk driving, speeding, stopping violations, seat belts, and texting, if you just enforce those five things, you're going to get most of your traffic safety. <laughs> yeah. That's the critical control point approach, is figuring out what are the important things to measure. A good critical control point uh, pinpoints a lot of problems. Right. Like if I go out on a farm, a major critical control point is lameness, you know, difficulty walking, sore feet. There may be 10 different things that can make cattle lame. But I don't measure those other 10 things. If I measure the lameness, then I've done a screen for all those other problems that might be making cattle lame. Sure. And then it's up to the veterinarians and the managers to fix them. Well, anybody can make a complicated thing that no one's done before. The hard thing in art, science, engineering is to make something simple that changes everything. Well, it's think simple. The other night I was on the plane and the jet bridge would come up to the plane because it was skidding on the ice. <laughs> and uh, people were missing their connections. Well, instead of just throwing some salt under the wheels, they bring the de-icing truck out to try to spray under the jet bridge. I got to watch that. <laughs> okay, that's an example of not thinking simple. Right. The salt ought to be the first thing you think of. Sure. And then right after I experienced that, I saw the coolest shovel, that <laughs> snow shovel that had round hoops for handles. It was very, mm. very clever. I'd really like to try it out. Totally original design, and it's simple, and it's also highly patentable. That's what we need. We're in and the market I'd, for new shovel. I would really like to try that. <laughs> shovel out compared to a regular shovel. I have a feeling it's going to be better than a regular shovel. It's completely novel. Yeah, especially right now when everything is just covered in well, snow. Well, that's right. <laughs> and, and I'd never seen a shovel before that had two rings, maybe six inches in diameter, for handles on it. C can we get those? Well, I'm, I don't know. I think if I went online and typed in shovel with the rings for handles. Hmm. But the thing I learned a long time ago in design I'd always say, think simple. Yeah. Don't think complicated. What is the simple? Think simple. Hmm. The de-icing machine is not thinking simple. Salt under the wheels is. Hmm. Think simple. Let's talk about the river of suck. This is an analogy that one of my mentors, John McGann, who is one of my professors at Berkeley, came up with. And he used it in my lessons to try and get me to reach further with my learning aspirations. You're on one side of the river of suck. Behind you is your comfort cave. You're on your comfort shore. And you can look to the other side and see miniature versions of yourself. You can do the things that you wish you could do now. But the problem is, in between you and the future versions of yourself on the other side, there's a raging river of suck filled with whitewater rapids, rocks, and thought piranhas. You always can learn something, but people also have to see where there's opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's a scene in the HBO movie that's really important where I go up to the editor of the, our state farm magazine in Arizona and I get his card because mm -hmm. I realized if I wrote for that magazine, it would really help my career. Mm -hmm. Then I started writing for him. Now, that's a door that a lot of people either don't see it or they're too afraid to go up. I also want to add that the HBO movie shows visual thinking absolutely accurately, mm. and it shows my projects accurately. Yeah. Part of the river is identifying where you want to go, where you want to put the energy into your well, focus. I, well, I think a lot of things is, 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 is to have a goal, mm -hmm. because I was a bad student in school. I didn't study at <laughs> all in high school until my science teacher got me interested in science, and then 
studying became a pathway to a goal. Wow. I think that's really important. I think another thing we need to be looking at in education is where is the student 10 years after high school? Hmm. I, would, I had already graduated from college by that time with a psychology degree. I'd already gone, gotten my master's degree in animal science, and I was designing and building those dip fat projects that you saw in the movie. Mm -hmm. I, I can also think of a lot of places I don't want a student to go. <laughs> but it's important to have, uh, you know, to have goals. Right. So in, in picking those goals and placing your efforts in the proper place, I think that's a lot of what you're talking about, getting kids with autism to focus on their strengths. Well, we need to, we need to build on the strengths. Yeah. You also need to broaden it. When I was eight years old in third grade, I just would draw the same horse head over and over again. <laughs> and it became obvious that I was good at art. And my mother would broaden my skills. Hmm. And I uh, said, well, draw it saddle, draw it stable. You know, you want to broaden it. If the kid likes cars, uh, then we can read, read about cars. We can learn about the history of the auto industry. We can study uh, the math and the science involved with cars. Mm -hmm. Take that interest in cars and broaden it. Hmm. And the other big problem I'm seeing with kids now, especially on the fully verbal end of the spectrum, is they're not learning how to work. Hmm. Getting too babied. Uh, they should be doing chores when they're young, when they're around 11 or 12, volunteer jobs, walking dogs for the next door neighbors. Uh, it's really important that they do a job outside the home on a schedule. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing too many moms get too hung up in being a special needs mom, and I'm seeing 16-year-old honor student who ought to go work for a tech company who's never gone shopping by himself, not learning basic skills. I think a lot of kids and people not on the autistic spectrum are experiencing the same challenges and could take that same advice. Well, yes, but I think it hurts the <laughs> autistic kid more than it hurts oh. the normal kids. The normal kids okay, will kinda, yeah. are going to kind of muddle through it. Mm. Another thing you've got to worry about with autistic kids is if I was a computer, I've got you know, the cloud storage. Mm -hmm. But then I'm, I'm accessing it through a phone that sometimes has poor service. Hmm. So multitasking is a problem. Working memory is a problem. Yeah. So tasks that involve sequence, I need to make myself a pilot's checklist of the steps, maybe on how to set up a coffee machine, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just a, called a workaround in engineering. In your book, Thinking in Pictures, you mentioned doors or gates visualized yes. in your brain as incremental steps to pathways to well, change. Well, that's right. Yep. And the movie showed the doors really yeah. well. See, when I'm mean, a visual thinker, I don't have any real abstract thinking. So to think about something like the future, um, I've got to have something visual that mm. I can use. I have to have a visual picture. Now, as I've gotten older and I've got more and more huge visual memories, <laughs> big Google images in my brain, right. I don't need the door so much. But in the beginning, I didn't have that big a database. You see, a person with autism is a bottom-up thinker. Mm -hmm. So you have to fill the database. Yeah. And I was just fascinated to learn about three years ago that um, artificial intelligence, for example, for disease diagnosis, thinks exactly the same way. Mm. You train it with lots and lots and lots of specific examples. Like, for example, um, uh, these pictures are melanoma cancer and these pictures are something else. Mm. So it learns to sort. Right. Each swimming stroke across that river Gets you just a little bit further. Well, the and other thing, I now just, I'm yeah. seeing a picture on my aunt's ranch. Ooh. Living out in the country, we'd have rainstorms and <laughs> dirt roads, and we'd have uh, what they call washes, where water would come across the road. And Ann taught me the safety. You walk into the wash, and if it, was, if it went above your knee, you waited. And then you had to walk all the way across to make sure it wasn't undermined. And then there was this big, huge, gigantic wash that was like six foot deep. <laughs> and you could look down it and see wrecked cars from like 30 years ago mm. where people have been stupid enough to drive into it. Ooh. No. If the river's really nasty, you got to wait. Because if you drive in that really big wash, you're going to be killed. And so, as yeah. I'm, you see, you're talking about a river. So now I'm seeing places where uh, that was a river you wouldn't want to cross. Yeah. Um, I got, was interviewed by Dr. Oliver Sacks, and we went up to Estes Park. And he wanted to go jump in the river right by a dam, and I had to stop him because he could have gone over the dam. And so I'm seeing that. So now I'm kind of in my, uh, my river yeah. um, 
I'm river uh, pictures. I'm now at my grandfather's apartment, which looked out over the Charles River. Hmm. So I'm seeing that. Wow. There's something to be said for the comfort shore without crossing. Well, on the other hand, you're eventually going to cross. Yeah. Sometimes you have to wait. Right. When the worst ah, yes. sharks are there, you better wait. Mm. So, well, that big six foot deep wash, you're going to have to wait for, uh, maybe four hours mm-hmm. and it'll go down. And then you cross it. You don't cross it when it's raging. That doesn't seem that long. I could wait for it. Well, hours. that's the way that's the way these washes <laughs> worked. Yeah. Um, you had a small one. We might have to wait a uh, half an hour, and if we were lucky, the ice cream wouldn't be all melted. Yeah. Because we'd make a, a weekly trip into town to go shopping. Mm. But as I talk about these things, I see it. Mm. Now I'm seeing a wash that was right in front of my aunt's house, where the wash was completely dry, and there was about a foot of water, almost like a wall coming mm. down it. And I stood right there and I watched it. I think that's, that's why you don't yeah. want to camp in a flood zone. <laughs> <laughs> You're an inventor. You built something, I believe you call it the squeeze machine. Yep, that's right. That- when I got into puberty, terrible anxiety <laughs> attacks. And I was out at my aunt's ranch when I was 15. Mm-hmm. And I noticed that when they put the cattle in the squeeze chute for their vaccination, sometimes they kind of relax. So I went and tried it. And there's a lot of people, autism, sensory processing disorder, where deep pressure calms them down. Hmm. It does not work on everybody. I want to emphasize that. Hmm. And sensory yeah. issues can be very, very variable. Uh, but now, um, uh, weighted blankets have gone mainstream. I just saw some advertised just the other day in a store for just regular people, too. Yeah. I think one of the most cool things about it is you ran into resistance from the people around you when you were building it. They said it was bad. You shouldn't do it. Well, there were also the, there were people that helped me, too. Mm-hmm. Most of the people that really gave me resistance were not the big bosses. Ah. It was the foreman level of people, that mm. level of management in between the owners of a feed yard and the workers working on the ground. Huh. It was those foremans. In just about every case, that's where the trouble was. And so I'd have a situation where the big bosses that owned the yard were all for me, and it was their foreman that put that metal plate into the dip vat and it killed the cattle. That actually did happen. Hmm. And then we took it out and everything worked fine. Right. Well, how did you know it was the right thing? People were saying, don't do this. I could don't get in there yourself. I could see it. I could just see how it would work. Hmm. And it worked absolutely perfectly. I asked the River of Silk swim team if they had any questions for you. Kathleen asks, I wonder if Temple Meditates has a meditation practice, what that looks like, and have you found it helpful? Or is that kind of your squeeze machine? Is that Well, the squeeze machine broke about 10 years ago, and I'm not using it anymore. And, and lots of times I just will get thoughts on how to solve a problem when mine's kind of idling. <laughs> like driving on open freeway mm-hmm. or just walking across campus or in the shower. Yeah. And I, that's when a thought will come to me. Just when I'm going off to sleep, I'll see a solution to a problem. And I'll get things where we're trying to solve a problem. Mm-hmm. We're discussing it on the phone. And then after I hang up, five minutes later, I get the answer. Yeah. Sometimes there's a little bit of a delayed reaction. Hmm. Yeah. For me, I love walking around mountains in nature. If I'm not talking to anybody, but I'm moving yeah. or doing something else, that's that's a really good good moment. Well, I get really happy now if I have a mom say to me that they went to one of my talks five years ago, and now their kids uh, had gone to college and gotten a job, Yeah, uh, and it's been really successful and having a good life, uh, that makes me happy. Yeah, making a difference. I want to see real change take place. I'm not into theory. <laughs> I'm into... What do we do to get real results Hmm. on things? And my mind tends to sort things into categories. It's bottom-up thinking. And when I discovered uh, three years ago that that's the way artificial intelligence will diagnose a a disease, uh, that was like a major light bulb moment. Hmm. I go, it's the autistic brain. Who do you think made it after all? I've been out (laughs) to Silicon Valley. Half those programmers are on the autism spectrum. And the thing is, they avoid the labels. Hmm. They totally avoid the labels. Hmm. But it doesn't mean it's not there. 
Oh, it's there. <laughs> I've been there. I've seen it. <laughs> you might want to look up Bill Gates' antitrust deposition ah. videos. Go ahead and look those up. I'll let you make your own mind up about it. Ha. Huh. There you have it. I want to bring you back to that flow state, your connection to the cattle machine. When you operate it yep, unconsciously, right. it works, and then you think about it, and it stops. Do you have any strategies to get into a flow well, state? Well, first thing you have to do is you have to practice operating it. Ah, And yes. the other thing I would do, I'd, I'd go into the plant. To do, this was on equipment startup. Mm -hmm. I went into the plant uh, the day before and I tried all the controls to see exactly how they worked. Hmm. Then, while I was laying in bed, I'd practice them in my mind. Ah. Now, at the time that I was doing that, I didn't know that athletes actually do that same kind of practice. Mm -hmm. And it uh, stimulates the motor cortex. As do musicians. And then I found that if I didn't think about the controls, then they worked. If I thought about them, then they did not work. It's just so hard to, like, how do you turn that on and off, you know, the thinking and unthinking? That's the hard part, I think, for a lot of people. And including well, you sort of can, yeah. there, I can understand flow. One time I was in Arizona a long time ago at a feed yard called Arlington Cattle Company. Mm -hmm. And um, I was running the hydraulic squeeze chute to hold the cattle for vaccinations. And I just kind of, like, almost will the cattle just to quiet, <laughs> come in quietly. Everything was working so great. And then a bucket of stuff tipped over. <laughs> and that wrecked the flow. Wow. I couldn't get it back again. I mean, that's that's why a lot of musicians turn to, like, alcohol and drugs and artists. Well, and I wasn't on anything when I, when I was <laughs> doing that. Now, I do take antidepressants. I started taking them in my early 30s because I was getting crippling panic attacks. Mm -hmm. And that reduced the anxiety. Now, I just read an article today that Prozac doesn't work for autism. Yeah, that for OCD it doesn't work. I'll tell you where it does work in autism, anxiety. Antidepressant mm. medication saved me. I'm taking one of the old medications, Dicipramine. And the mistake that often gets made is using way too high a dose. Then you get agitation and insomnia. Right. But I uh, stopped the constant panic. I found out in a brain scan that my fear center, the amygdala, was three times larger than normal. So my nervous system was just ramped up, looking for danger all the time even when there was nothing dangerous around. And what the yeah. disipramine did is it kind of like turned it down. Hmm. Like I, I compared it to adjusting the idle screw on an old-fashioned carburetor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so is fear a bad thing? Well, you need a certain amount of fear uh, so you don't do something stupid like just walk out in the middle of the street. That's right. <laughs> I was going to talk about animals next, but then you mentioned fear. Well, cattle and horses are prey species animals. And, they're very, and vision is a dominant sense when it comes to things that they are afraid of. Also, visual thinking is specific. Hmm. There was a study done in Germany by Lerner and Fent. And what Lerner and Fent found is if you train a horse to tolerate a blue and white umbrella suddenly opening, that doesn't transfer to tarp, uh, tarps and canvas flapping oh, yeah. around. Just it's umbrellas. not going to transfer to flags. What about a red umbrella? Well, you see, that's still shaped like an umbrella. Right, right. They have a little bit of an ability to generalize. Mm -hmm. So maybe a different umbrella would work. But right now, one of my students is um, working with, um, we're training a horse to walk by one of those big plastic kids' play sets. Mm -hmm. They're about, you know, four feet by four feet. You train the horse to go by it. And then when you rotate it 90 degrees, it looks different. The horse will act as if it's a brand new object. <laughs> now, a person who thinks verbally would look at that and go, yeah, that's a play set. Hmm. It wouldn't matter which way it was turned. Hmm. Many people have argued through time that animals don't have feelings. Well, they do have feelings. I think yeah. that's just ridiculous. <laughs> and Thank I am you. a big fan of the Pantskep emotional systems. You mm -hmm. have fear, hmm. then you have anger, then you have separation distress. He calls it panic. And separation distress, that's why the dog is home alone. He's tearing up the house. That's a separate um, brain system from fear. Then you have seek, which is the urge to explore. Ah. Like it's been found that some cattle uh, really like to get out and graze a lot. That was some research done at New Mexico State University. Some dogs really like to chase the ball. 
another Labrador <laughs> makes a great service dog and could care less about the ball. One's a mm. high seek, a low seek. Then, of course, you've got sex. Then you've got the mother young nurturing, the oxytocin system, and then you've got play. And both genetics and experience can uh, set how strong these things are. Kind of imagine like a music mixing board that you've got on your computer, mm -hmm. and genetics will set it at a certain level, but experience Whoa. can also upregulate or downregulate the nervous system. And so animals definitely have emotions. Now, yeah. there's been a lot of discussion in the neuroscience literature right now, and one neuroscientist said, well, I think the reason why there's some people think that they don't really experience things the same way is because they don't have language. Hmm. And I think for some people that think totally in words, it's difficult for them to imagine thought without words. Right. And so uh, one important fear researcher, Joseph Ledoux, just says, well, the animals just have fear survival circuits. They don't really uh, experience it the way we do. Well, I think it really gets right down to a thinking in language. Hmm. has a difficult time with it. Right. I've been going through a lot of this literature, and to me it's obvious that animals have emotions uh, because psychiatric drugs have the same effect on animals as they have on people. Mm -hmm. Prozac does work on dogs. Yeah, and Joy, my wife, really turned me into a cat person, and I think cats have changed my life. Okay, well, good. <laughs> I never really had any furry pets growing up, and we're on our second cat because our first one died tragically, but they're so different. And they have so many different things they do and act and they respond to everything around them. They respond to how you're feeling, what you're doing. I just think it seems ridiculous. Well, it is ridiculous. That, that they don't feel Now, there's anything. a complexity of yeah. thought mm. that they don't have. It's simpler. Hmm. Uh, you know, words, you can get into some very big complex things. But some really super abstract oh, educational theories or philosophical theories – don't make any sense to me. I remember reading a linguistic theory uh, in some book that came from MIT years ago, and they were talking about uniframes with something to do with linguistics. And all I could see were these things they put cars on in the car factory that moved the cars around in the factory. Those were uniframes. Wow. Because there's no way I could think about a uniframe as an abstract concept that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. So here's a question for my mom. What can animals teach us about perseverance? And what do animals do when they get discouraged? Well, animals can get frustrated the same way that the people get frustrated. I think it's important for uh, uh, animals and people that have, feel they have some control of their environment. Mm. And I went to a very interesting talk at a laboratory animal meeting. You know, they have primates in the lab. They get totally bored. Mm. There was this one primate. She was so bored, she was cutting herself. I said, how'd you get her to stop? Well, they put some raisins in the puzzle feeder, and she'd have to work to get the raisins out of this kind of little puzzle box. That's right. And she still cut herself. So then one day, they put trail mix in it. So hmm. now you've got a variety of nuts, colored M&Ms, chocolate chips. And so what she would do is she would just spend all day pulling out the red M&Ms. <laughs> and... And it took a lot of work to like pull out the red M&Ms and not M &M take enthusiast. anything else out. No, she didn't really want red M&Ms oh. because the next day she'd do a different object. Oh. She liked the challenge wow. of just getting the red M&Ms out of this box and nothing else out of it. <laughs> That's so cool. And then she could concentrate all day on this. <laughs> yeah, animals are incredible. Speaking of thinking differently, I have a theory that even plants feel things. Carrots, trees, fruit, they're just having a different experience of life that's different from what we feel. Well, Do you think that's plant, possible? Yeah, plants can react. And this gets into reaction versus some kind of experience. Hmm. Um, this, if you can remove the head from cattle at the slaughterhouse, take their head off so hmm. there's no brain. And uh, take an electric prod and poke the body, and it will react. Hmm. Is it feeling that? No. There's a circuit in the center of the spine that, that makes the reciprocal movement. No, it's not feeling anything. <laughs> um, 
I've just looked up some research on do bees feel pain because I'm working on updating my animal welfare book. Mm. Fish and mammals, all mammals, will uh, self-medicate for pain. So if you artificially hurt the joints, um, chickens and rats will uh, either eat or drink nasty-tasting painkillers, and then as oh, right. they, instead of plain water or regular plain feed, then as the leg heals, they'll switch off of that. And that experiment, I just found the paper last night, has been duplicated in the bee. And you have a control bee, and then you have one where you cut their leg off. <laughs> and they don't drink more of the painkiller. Huh. Now, they do drink more fluid, but I think that's to account for losing the hydraulic pressure inside their bodies. they got an open circulatory system. So sure. if they're in trouble, if they, uh, they're trying to keep their circulatory system operating. Yeah. Uh, now, there is some evidence that insects, when they get injured and heal, you upregulate the nervous system. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's sort of an upregulating. That's not, it's hard to say what that is. It makes you more reactive. Right. But they don't, on the acute pain, they failed the self-medication test. And that was a paper I just located. Now, you take clams and scallops. I'm not worried about clams and scallops. Yeah. But bees, if you think about it, bees <laughs> got a more, much more complicated, uh, hmm. or an ant, much more complicated nervous system. So I think this gets down to nervous system complexity and having a certain amount of a node of neurons in a brain. It's called encephalization huh. in neuroscience. I guess I just don't want to discount their experience. Just well, they do I'm experience. A, There's a yeah. fascinating paper called <laughs> Multiple Stored Views. Huh. This is about ants. When they go out and forage, how do they find their way back home? Well, as they're walking out to forage, they'll turn around and almost like take a snapshot of a landmark and then go and then go a little further, turn around and take a snapshot. So when they come back, they're matching those images. I've done the same thing when I've gone places. I'll go, oh, I think I saw that barn when I'm driving by. I'll turn around briefly, turn my head briefly, and I'll go, yep, yep, I saw that barn because I know what it looked like um, going by it. And um, ants will help injured herd mates. They actually, you know, if they're not too bad, if they, they triage them. If they're too badly hurt, they, they don't help them. <laughs> if they've got, you know, kind of minor injuries, they bring them back to the colony and lick the wounds and help them heal. Hmm. So there's some complicated behavior there in ants that you don't have in clam and scallop welfare is not on my list of concerns. That's why we're not worried about now eating you take, raw oysters. No. <laughs> now, you take the cephalopods, the octopus. Mm -hmm. You read Cy Montgomery's book on the octopus, but you got a lot more brain there. Yeah. You see, I think it gets down to what the neuroscience calls encephalization. Hmm. You've got to have a and, and, and complexity of behavior. It seems that a lot of, quote, normal people have trouble observing themselves objectively. My podcast is based on the idea that it can be hard to deal with your emotions. Yet because of your autism, you write that you see yourself as an observer. It seems that you can be objective where others can't. Well, I find as a scientist, there's a lot of people where they can't separate the judgment of a scientist's work in his papers, his publications, from him as a person. Hmm. I mean, I know... A scientist, for example, I think he's a complete jerk as a person, but I cite his research. Huh. I separate yeah. my thinking of him as a complete jerk from uh, uh, citing his papers. His papers are worth citing. He's done some good research. Hmm. And I've learned that other people don't seem to be able to do that. They'll just call his papers rubbish. Right. And they're not rubbish. Huh. Well, Even though I don't like him as a person. Yeah, that's happening a lot. Where it's this cancel culture. Oh, someone did something bad. Don't listen to their art. Don't, don't go see well, the movie. Well, I think they, the problem we've got with social media is is no thought goes into it. I read an interesting article in Harper's uh, Magazine, and they interviewed the guy who invented the retweet button on Twitter, Ooh. where where you can just push it instantly. Where before you might have to do three or four clicks to copy and paste. Mm -hmm. I think he wishes he hadn't done it <laughs> because he said the retweet button is like giving a gun to a four-year-old. This is in an article I read in Harper's <laughs> Magazine. Uh, but the problem with it is it's so instant that nobody is thinking about what they're doing. Mm. Things are not that simple. 
do you think maybe that's a question of slowing down? Like in your book, thinking in pictures, drawing, when you slow down, oh, I have that to improves slow down. the quality. I have to slow down to see the image. I remember, never will forget art class that I did mm-hmm. in college. It was a two-hour long art class, and one of the assignments was to take our shoe off. Mine was an old, moldy canvas sneaker. And we sit in kind of a circle, and you took your shoe <laughs> and put it two foot in front of you, and you had to spend the entire class drawing it with pencil, and they didn't want me erasing. And so I really visualized that sneaker, and I couldn't believe what a great moldy sneaker I drew. Mm-hmm. And I wish I still had that picture. But that was a very good assignment to force you to slow down. Because when I'm drawing a cattle handling facility, I've got to think about the concrete, how the post goes in the concrete, how I'm going to weld the fence to it, and the little clips that hold the, the fence mm-hmm. on when you weld it. I, I can see those things. And when I first started, I went to every feed yard in Arizona and I worked cattle, and that was filling up the database with everything that existed. Hmm. So then I can visualize the different pieces and then put them together in different ways. Some other people might take that advice to slow down before they make overly emotional decisions. I think it would be a really good idea to slow down (laughs) and think because it's kind of scary to me a lot of decisions that people make just you know it's just a snap judgment mm-hmm. and not thinking about things right that's one of the problems with that book snap judgment is not thinking can bring you to the right thing or it might not well sometimes it brings it you might, to a decision well it might be some things that bring you to the right thing <laughs> or the wrong thing you decide going now I'm going back to that big gigantic wash that was yeah. six foot deep out by my aunt's ranch and seeing the wrecked cars in it hmm. Uh, yeah, if you just drove, did a snap judgment, drove across that, you'd be in a lot of trouble. Talk about your river of suck. That'd be a gigantic river of suck. That's right. You'd probably be dead if you drove into that. I'll never forget that wash. Here's a question from Rob. Is there anything you're unafraid of that most people are anxious about? Well, I used to be afraid of public speaking. And one of the things I had to do is I learned to make sure I had really good slides. So if I panicked, then I had my slides. The other thing I was terrified of was airplanes. Because when I was a (laughs) senior in high school, I was in a very scary emergency landing. So they put the gear down. I thought the bottom of the plane was falling out of me. It's ridiculous. Well, the way I got over that is aviation had to go from scary to interesting. Well, now I subscribe to an aviation magazine. Huh. Back in the early 70s, I got the ride in the cockpit of an old Constellation with a load of Holstein heifers going down to uh, Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. And I learned um, every way that the uh, cargo department could torture aircraft and they still flew. That helped me get over it. So you take the thing you're afraid of, make it interesting. Uh. You see, that turns on the seek system. Turns the seek system on. I love that so much. Because uh, my career would have been not good if I hadn't done public speaking or, or mm-hmm. was afraid to go on airplanes. Another thing that's really helped my career, and I think it's really important for listeners to understand this, I didn't realize until relatively recently how much writing helped me advance my ideas. Mm. Because I did those dip fat projects and I wrote about it. Yeah. And that goes back to getting the um, editor's card. But in the last five years, this is uh, you know just coming up on 2020 right now, we've been seeing more problems with graduate students and undergraduate students, really awful writing skills, run-on sentences, and, I'm fi- and I question these kids, and they're smart kids, and I'm finding out that they're getting through school, they've gotten through all the college and everything, and they've never done a book report Ooh. where you summarize a book. They had never Ooh. had a teacher mark up the work and learn how to write. And I kind of took good writing skills for granted. And I've had to teach some of my graduate students how to write. I've had to just mark up their papers. And then another thing I've had them do is uh, read the paper out loud at home. And that helped them. Yeah. Writing was an extremely important part of my career, and it still is. But it wasn't always easy. Well, writing wasn't that hard. Math was the difficult thing for Ah. me. No, the writing was, was, by the time I got kicked out of ninth grade, I was a good writer. But I couldn't do algebra. And what I'm worried about today (laughs) is uh, algebra screening a lot of the visual thinkers out, and you need us right. to prevent messes like Fukushima. It's not a good idea when you live next to the sea that puts you super important, electrically driven 
emergency cooling pump in a non-waterproof basement. That seems Not insane. a good idea. Oof. But they did. And what I've learned <laughs> is the mathematical mind doesn't see the water filling the basement. Oof. This is where you need to have all the different kinds of minds. I can't design a nuclear reactor, but maybe you need me to design the safety systems. There you go. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on failure? Well, you're going to just have some you learn from your mistakes. And I had a major project failure in 1980, and I learned trying to solve genetic problems in pigs with equipment was a really bad idea. <laughs> and you've got to look at root causes of problems. And this was this old cons plant, Cincinnati, 1980. You know, they had the old-fashioned plant, and the pigs and the cattle have to walk upstairs. And they had some pigs that couldn't walk upstairs. They wanted to build this stupid conveyor system, sort of like a moving sidewalk. It was a disaster. It flipped them over backwards. <laughs> and then uh, I noticed that Oof. the pigs that couldn't walk up the ramp came from a single farm. Oh. And they had a genetic defect called spraddle leg. And I got to thinking, we could have bought them new boars and bred that problem out hmm. rather than building all this equipment that did not work. Uh, but I kind of went in a big depression over that. Hmm. But that's where I learned <clears throat> that I can't solve everything with engineering. Hmm. And the problem was coming from the farm, not from the, from the plant. Hmm. Uh, it was a very uh, oh, p- terrible experience. I had to go back and cut the thing up with torches, and I managed to still have the client. They asked me to build it. I'm going to guess it was maybe um, half my fault, but I went and accepted all the fault. Still managed to keep the client, but I learned a big lesson where engin- there are certain problems you don't fix with engineering. How can we be better at supporting our friends and people we know with autism? Well, let's start with little kids. If you have a three-year-old who's not talking, you've got to get early intervention. If you're in a situation where you're short on money, you need to go to your church group, get some volunteers. You've got to start working with the kid. I've got a good book called The Way I See It. Mm-hmm. Then as the child gets older, I, I build up the thing they're good about, the thing that they're good in. And I talk about different strengths in my book, The Autistic Brain. I build on what the kid is good at. That's the thing to do. Sensory issues are a problem if the kid's noise sensitive. Mm-hmm. If the child controls that vacuum cleaner, it's going to be better tolerated. Or maybe the uh, hair dryer is really noisy. They can turn the hair dryer on and off where they control it. Then they may get to tolerate that. Multitasking is an issue. Mm-hmm. Any task that involves a sequence, make a pilot's checklist with the steps so you're not loading a working memory. I managed to avoid being bullied in elementary school because my teacher in third grade, explained to the other children that I had a disability that was not visible like a wheelchair or crutches. Mm. And that's now called peer-mediated intervention. That's a fancy name for that. But in high school, I was getting bullied. And the only places I was not bullied was where there was shared interests, horseback Mm. riding, model rockets, and electronics. Friends through shared interests. It could be music. It could be theater. I talked to one mom and and her son, her autistic son was doing great in high school. He was in band and loving it. And another one's getting tortured with bullying. But hmm. friends through shared interests. And don't get too hung up on the label. Half of right. Silicon Valley is autistic, and they're avoiding the label. And they're uh, running some pretty big, important stuff right now. All right. So how about our adult friends who might have gone undiagnosed? Well, there's a lot of adults... Um, coming, you know, finding out that they're on the autism spectrum. I'm having granddads come up to me all the time, and they're an engineer or an accountant, some other decent job, and they're discovering they're on the spectrum. Well, where it's helpful is with relationships. Mm -hmm. And I have a book called Different Not Less. It's 14 old Asperger's, uh, you uh, you know, fully verbal autistics, that discover later in life that they're on the spectrum, and they've done well in the work field, But their relationships are all messed up, and that's where the diagnosis gave them insight, and they give their personal experiences in in this book, Different Not Less. (laughs) 
Well, I want to thank you, Temple, so much for spending some time with me. I really appreciate it. You've peppered in a lot of books and movies and websites to go check out. So I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Well, I've got two websites. So I've got templegrandon.com is my autism website. Grandon.com is my livestock website. Mm. For people that are uh, in small uh, uh, livestock farming, I've got a book, Temple Grandin's Guide to Working with Farm Animals. And then in my autism books, I've got Thinking in Pictures, Emergence Labeled Autistic, The Way I See It, especially if you're working with young kids, this Different Not Less book where the older people uh, talk about their lives. Those are just a few of my books. They're all available online. Cool. Okay, we're finished with the book ads now. Go buy them. Yes, go buy them. They're awesome books. Okay, I want to ask you a question. What were some of the things you liked the most about some of my books? You're talking about how different people think and kind of observing yourself. It really brought me in to your world so much that I forgot that I was reading a book. When I read your books, music appears in my head. Okay. And when I stop to think, it stops. But when I focus on your words the music comes back. Well, what kind of music do you get when you read my books? I got a fiddle tune. I wrote down eight parts of music in reading about 30 pages. But what what, what part of the book were you reading? I was reading the beginning of thinking of Oh, where I talk about, I think in pictures, like a VCR in my head. When you were talking about the way you think, it set my brain off unconsciously to think of new ideas. It was... It was just a really great experience. Was it original music? Yeah, original okay. music. It'll probably be part of the soundtrack to this episode. Well, that's absolutely great. So in other words, <laughs> you got totally absorbed into visual thinking. Yeah. And then there's an interesting book for the pattern thinkers. It's called Daniel Tammet, Born on a Blue Day, where mm-hmm. music uh, and math make patterns. He sees math in patterns. Mm. It's not the way I think. But I got a lot of insight in reading that. Very cool. And then thinking in pictures. I'm, you know, my book, I talk about um, pictures in my head, and the HBO movie shows exactly how I think. The thinking wow. in the HBO movie is accurate. That's so cool. Joy, do you have any questions? Joy grew up on a farm. So I wonder, these days everybody's on the Internet. Yes. And largely... We are experiencing life through pictures online. Yep. I did grow up on a farm, and we didn't have a television or anything. My parents said, if you're bored, go play outside. Well, that's what we did. I mean, we got the first television in our neighborhood when I was five. But we spent all kinds of time just outside playing, making stuff, build stuff out of cardboard and paper, and uh, go play in the brook and go play in the field. That's what we did as kids. I wonder if a lot of our fears and anxieties come from not having that physical, tangible experience on life and instead focusing too much on... I think we've got to get kids back doing real stuff. We've got kids growing up today totally separated from the world of the practical. In fact, I've got a book for kids called Calling All Minds. It's all my childhood projects. Little bird kites and parachutes and other little aviation experiments. And I found that duplicating some of those as a grown-up wasn't all that easy. But if you're totally divorced from the world of real things, then sometimes you might not have a, you know, very uh, realistic ideas about how to improve things. You know, people will say, what do I do about the schools or something? And I said, it's one school at a time. In fact, I just talked to uh, some people this morning about a very good school that we've got right here in Fort Collins. And... And I said, you need to write about how you do the experiential learning, you know, getting good uh, test scores without teaching to the test. Explain exactly how you do it. That's what I did with cattle handling. I don't want theoretical stuff. I'd explain to people how to build facilities. I took pictures of shadows and things that scared cattle and explained how to do it, made little diagrams of how to move cattle. Okay, they need to be explaining like a tip, some typical assignments they do. In other words, leave the theory out. Tell me how to do it. Leave the politics out of it. Leave the theory out of it. Just write about how you do it and put it up online. And we're going to fix things one school at a time. Don't try to fix the whole world. It gets back I, to that simple. I think yeah, simple. Think, <laughs> yeah. think simple. That's what it gets back to. Cool. Yeah, that's that, the name of the episode is <laughs> think okay. simple. I All like right. it. <laughs>
No one ever said crossing the river of suck would be easy or that you had to do it alone. So thanks for tuning in and giving it a chance. Be sure to visit riverofsuck.com for all the latest updates. Become a member of the River of Suck swim team for just $1 a month to support this podcast and access boatloads of bonus content. Much of the music you've been hearing throughout this episode is from a piece of mine called Thinking in Pictures, which came to me as I read Temple's book of the same name. You'll hear the whole thing in just a moment, and you can grab an mp3 download at riverofsuck.com. My name is Andy Reiner. Uh, my name's Temple Grandin. Keep swimming. <laughs>